Welcome to Toppy TV. It is my pleasure to say I am joined by one of the absolute heavyweights of journalism in the UK, Europe, and dare I say the world. Henry Winter, welcome to Toffee TV. I think more overweight than heavyweight, but thanks for the <laughs> intro. <laughs> no, you're doing you're, you're doing a fine job. You're doing a fine job. Out there on your own now, aren't you? Henrywinter.com is where we can all find your articles now. How, how, yeah, I mean it's interesting. I mean yeah. it's 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 been eye opening. I mm. mean, you know, you guys are the, uh, the the first draft of history now. Yeah, you know, with 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 what you do, the uh, it's uh, it's good. It's been uh, got a couple of books on the go. I'm going to um, the uh, the Euros to cover England because I thought, well, I've been to 14, 15 tournaments and watch England labour and not win anything. So uh, with the front six like they've got now, um, you know, whether I mean. France and Portugal and, and others have got great squads, but uh, I didn't want to miss the chance of England. No, something. absolutely, absolutely. What I, I, I can't wait, to be honest. I look forward to the, to the tournament more than anything else. Now, I absolutely love tournament football. Um, I'm not so sure about the World Club Championships next summer, but certainly um, certainly the internationals, It's still um, I still think it's the biggest thing in football, either the Euros or the World Cup or... or or dare I say the Copper America, if you obviously if you're in South America, I still think it's the best and biggest thing in football. I know I know the Champions League is as a huge place in people's hearts now, but tournament football, summer internationals, that's to me, that's the tradition that we all grew up with. I think no matter what generation you are, I think we all we all grew up that and, and I can't wait for for this uh, for this for this summer's Euros. Yeah, what will you do if Anthony Gordon plays well? Oh, I, listen! I'm I am fine with Anthony Gordon. Honestly, I think that was the best deal that ever happened for for both teams and the and the uh, and the player himself. I'm I'm quite happy for him and quite happy mm. for us. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be so happy when the day he starts wearing a Liverpool shirt because I do think that will happen. But I'm really? I'm I'm all right with I'm all right. It might be more more so someone called. Jared Brantwaite, that I'd be uh, horrified to see um, in someone else's share. But Andy Gordon, I can, I'm, I'm all right with that one. But the only thing about Jared Brantwaite is that you'll get an extra 20 million if he does go. Mm -hmm. I hope he stays, but he's, he's you know, ambitious and whatever the financial situation is. If he goes and has a good Euros, if he manages to push Maguire out of the team, yeah. he's English, he's left-sided, there's a premium on both. So uh, I saw one or two figures being quoted around today for, for Jared Branthwaite. I, I promise he'll go for a lot more than that. Oh, absolutely. And I think Everton have, uh, have basically said they will not be, you know, they will not sell on the cheap and they will not, they will not let him go. But, I just, I mean, just on that. I mean, obviously, Everton, Everton, as we know, have had massive struggles in the past season with, you know, PSR, and obviously, honestly, obviously, were punished twice. I mean, obviously, Nottingham Forest's argument on that was because of this line that is drawn right in the middle of the summer. I mean, what, what's your feelings on that? Because Everton are coming to a point this summer where they might have to sell a player. I mean, it looks like at the moment it's going to be Amadou Onana. But that line through the summer, that's, a, you know, you have to sell before that. Yet after that line, you could get a lot more for them. And this was Nottingham Forest segments, obviously on Brandon John Johnson last summer. I mean, it seems a really strange situation, this in football that we've created. That, um, certainly in the Premier League, a line during uh, a huge um, summer transfer window. It's, you find that strange? Yeah, very strange. It's like VAR drawing lines. You mm. know? I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. I mean, the line should be at the end of the transfer window. Yeah, and particularly, it's difficult to have it halfway through a tournament because what does that do? You know, the speculation might unsettle a player. I don't think Gareth Southgate will be particularly happy. Is if on June the whatever the the, the 29th, there's a lot of speculation about <clears throat> a player who might be starting for England in one of the knockout games. Uh, it's unfair on the player. It's unfair on the the club, mm. and also. If he has a good tournament, he will be worth 20 million more at the mm. end of the tournament than he would at the start. I mean, I can remember Rio Ferdinand going for 30 million and he'd been an 18 million pound player on the eve of what was it, 2002, um, when he went from Leeds to Manchester United. So, look, England matters in terms mm. of inflating a price. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. It should be that the PSR should come in at the end of the transfer window. Yeah, and we, we've obviously got that with Onan as well because he's in the Belgium squad. And I know I know a lot of people in this country may not have seen the best of Onana playing for Everton, but if he has a good Euros and that suddenly gets other people interested, gets fan bases interested, and we know fan bases can spark or push a football club 
you know, if they have had an interest in the player, no, if a if a fan base knows that interest is there, and they're a little bit worried that someone else coming from, they have a good. If he has a good Euros, then that could spark it as well, and that line's there as well. Everton will have to sell him on the cheap, or, or seemingly so, with with if they have to sell him for PSR. Yeah, well, I mean, I hope they get a, the, the, the proper price for him. I mean, mm. you have to be slightly wary of of buying players in in tournaments. Yeah, he's got a body of work going into the tournament. People know how good he is. But I do remember Manchester United buying Karol Poborski <laughs> off the back of a good Euros, and uh, it didn't quite work out for him there. So, but look, those two. I mean, I don't think you need to sell both, do you? Well, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I, I think Onana. The general feeling is, is it's his time has sort of come now. With that, it would might be best for everyone if he is the player. I think he's ready for the next challenge, and I think, I think Sean Dyche could do without him as well. We've seen Sean Dyche not use him in in plenty of games, even though he's a really good player. So he seems to be the one that Everton would probably be willing to sell. Um, obviously, no, no one wants to sell good players, but I think he'd be the one that we would be willing to sacrifice. The most important thing you need at the moment is a is a proper owner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to come on to that. I mean, obviously, um, before we touch on Sean Dyche and obviously the job he's done, I mean, 777, hopefully that saga will end this week. I mean, the 31st of May is the is the date we, we feel like it will all end. But this has been going on since September. I mean, what have you made of this complete, well, it just seems like a complete farce, farce now. I mean, this is rare for me, but I have some sympathy with the Premier League in this case because mm. they can't do anything about owners and directors test yeah. until the, the, the deal has been sealed or close to being sealed. I think the issue here is with Farhad Mashiri. I think mm. he's the one who needs to do the the, the due diligence into um, 777. I mean, you've only got to read some of the amazing work done by Josimar. Um, there are journalists there just highlighting the issues, shall we say gently, with uh, with 777. Um, and then you just, I mean, I can't believe, you know, they shouldn't be associated or linked to any big football club, mm. particularly not one of the sort of, you know, the stature and the importance and emotional connection between fans and club and community. It's Everton Football Club. So, you know, I, I hope that, dies its death this week and then whoever whether it's texter whether they're american um potential buyers in the background because if you are if you're an american and you're you look at a club you look at its unique qualities and that is manager that is history that is trophies that is squad but also its fan base and you look at the size of your fan base the passion of your fan base the fact that gladys street for me seems to have driven you and and you know, kept you up mm. through these difficult times. Obviously, Sean Dice and the, the players have been absolutely fantastic what they've done. But if you're looking at it from the outside, you, you know, you almost see, whether it's a sort of, almost like a Netflix prism, you see the characters, you mm. see Gladys Street, you see the power of the fans. And that is absolutely huge. And that will be part of the club's great selling point, the fan base inside the ground that emotion the fan base on social media even if it does get a bit lively at times but also the fan base throughout the world you know there'll be everton supporters clubs in new york and la and melbourne you'd know better than i would yeah. but you know you've you've got fans around the world and that's what they will look at and these owners will look at the potential for development in terms of how can we make more money out of the club which you can do so this sounds very cynical but mm -hmm. it's the way they'll look at it also when you new, move into the new stadium can they make more money out of the surrounding area is there regeneration potential mm. you know that i mean i was at uh, bramley more dot yesterday walking past and having to sort of appear through the fence the gates <laughs> and you you can just see that the potential there mm. the addition it's going to be to an already famous skyline the it's going to be a stunning stadium so you can see the potential and you think the americans went into chelsea and spent what two and a half billion i think and they've still got to spend another billion and a half uh, you know to sort out stanford bridge yeah okay it's london there's a premium on on london but you know your fan base is bigger than chelsea's so you know there's you've got so much going for you but you're going to have a bumpy mm. couple of years still yeah absolutely uh, what how do you see that i mean obviously covering covering all these Champions League teams. What what do you think that gap is now? Because obviously it's it's an issue that a lot of Everton fans struggle with is why hasn't someone come in for Everton? Lock, there was, I think there was four or five came in for Chelsea at the time when they went off for sale and Everton have struggled to attract that real 
blue chip owner. You know, what is that difference between a team who are in the Champions League regularly and someone who's just in the Premier League? Because we we are told all the time how big the Premier League is. So how do you see that 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 divide between? Um, the, well, maybe the six who tried to leave or, or certainly tried to join the Super League and everyone else in the Premier League? Well, you could argue you've got more credibility than the, the clubs that tried to leave the Premier League. Um, I think the owners or potential owners will look at it and they will see, and this this is just strikes misery into my heart, the possibility and the likelihood of Premier League games being spirited away to Dallas, to Miami, to mm. New York. You know, 300 bucks a ticket, um will the sort of you know the hardcore fans you guys will you will you travel can you afford to travel mm. the, you know taking time off work all those issues but they will look at that and they will see the success of nfl games at wembley and at tottenham hotspur stadium they'll look at the jacksonville jaguars look like it would not surprise me at all if they became the london franchise yeah. so they look at things differently and they will see the sort of, you know, the, the potential. They will look at the, the, the television rights and think there's more to come on that. They will look from their own perspective, this is from an American investor's perspective, of the World Cup in America in, in two years' time and the, the intensification of interest. Um, so there's a lot of potential in Everton, but there's also a lot mm. of mess to sort out first. Yeah. Do you think, um, just off the back of what you're saying there, do you think what's happened with Messi in America is almost setting setting that up for Premier League teams because what we've seen with, with Messi going there is clubs are have been switching their games to large NFL stadiums and I think just over the weekend they were due to play but well, they did play in Canada and the tickets were changing hands for up to $500 and Messi didn't actually play I know there was a massive outcry out of it do you think that's setting that's setting it up for they can see that that market is there for those clubs to go and play in, in America I mean I'm sure you've travelled around America the interest in in the Premier League, the EPL is mm. just absolutely huge. I mean, I covered the, the, the World Cup in, in 94 and you could wander around and not really know that, they're, you know, the biggest show in world sport was actually going on on their doorstep. They were more interested in, um, what's his name, who was um, oh, the, uh, the the guy, I think, passed away recently, who was who was being chased down the streets. Oh, OJ, being, OJ Simpson. OJ Simpson, <laughs> apologies. How could I forget? I mean, I went on a, a, a radio program there in Chicago and they sort of said, oh, we you know, got Mr. Winner from London, England, talking about this soccer ball competition. And, you know, I gave the beautiful spiel about the beautiful game and <clears throat> how wonderful football is, the real football. And then they opened up the, uh, the phone lines for, you know, sports phone-in and... Um, the first question was there was a pause and it just went getting back to OJ. And, <laughs> but now, you know, yeah. it's there, you know, serious FM and, yeah. and everyone's got these huge, Rodney Marsh has got his own program out there. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's huge. So look, you know, they're investors, but they can see the huge rise um, of, of English football and Everton's very much part of that, even though you've taken a few body blows over the past few years. No, absolutely. And of course, we're being linked with uh, the Crystal Palace shareholder, John Texter, at the moment, who obviously is part of a multi-club, um, you know, with with, with Leon and, and Botafogo and uh, another team in Belgium, I think, as well. And and we do seem to be attracting that kind of owner. And it's just that it's just we just I find it strange. And I think others find this strange that we just can't seem to attract that one person who seems to have enough money and enough credibility and experience as well uh, to come in and and obviously with the stadium as well because the stadium is only six months away from being uh, from being uh, built completely. I know it's not open until the summer of twenty twenty five, but it it just it just seems very very strange that we just can't attract one and I'm, I'm sure a lot of that is down to the the debt that the club are ca- carrying at the moment um, which is obviously a major issue with the football club and and that's going to affect us on and off the pitch but any club you buy you know they're going to be issues there mm. i mean you look at manchester united you know they've they've got to build a what a 2 billion pound stadium you know mm. you have got a fantastic stadium i know it's the, the cost of it has has gone up. What was it supposed to be two hundred and fifty initially, and now it's sort of like seven fifty mm. eight hundred million. I'm mean, I, I, I don't know exactly, but but you've got an amazing asset there. So look, I don't feel gloomy about clubs which have got a hardcore, loyal, yeah, expansive support which you've got because mm. owners will look at that. They'll look at the numbers. Numbers turn them on, and they'll look at that and they'll think, right, this club's got a chance because of the fan base. 
Yeah. Obviously, we've already mentioned, um, you know, the Euros and some of the players who are going, but just going back to that, I mean, Jared Brantwaite, as we mentioned before, he's got a lot of suitors this summer. Um, what did you make of his summer? Because obviously, he, sorry, his season, but he did come, he has been in the Everton team before this season. He obviously went on loan to Blackburn and then he's, he, last season he was at PSV and, and obviously didn't start the season. He came in after Everton's 4 0 defeat at Aston Villa and he's just gone from strength to strength and obviously scoring a goal in the miss side derby, which Everton won as well, was a huge moment for him. But, you know, how have you seen him from the outside? I, I, I like him. I like him as a player. He's still developing. But alongside Tarkovsky, that would have been an, an experience for him mm. this season. Uh, I love that left-footed switch that he can play. He's got a pass on him, which, you know, defenders absolutely need and, <clears throat> excuse me, in the modern game. So, absolutely, he's he's a very impressive player. I still think he's, you know, still got more to more to go and grow. But I bumped into him uh, in the corridor at St George's Park during the last England get together, and I just introduced myself, and he was just, you know, just seemed a really decent person. I mean, yeah, I probably had I know a minute with him, and I just thought, well, actually, there's there's you know, eye contact, handshake, how are you? You know, quite sort of respectful, um, but obviously can play, can look after himself. He's got a certain steel to him. Um, so look, he's he, and he's left-footed, left-sided. Mm. You know, there's absolute gold dust. I mean, I, I assume Kieran Trippier will play left back for England, right-footed on the left mm. because Luke Shaw can't be fit. And <clears throat> but maybe I, I think he's played one game this season at left back. You'd know better than I would. Um, but no, I think he'll 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 be first change for Maguire. Yeah, yeah, it's, he, he has been absolutely fantastic. And you, you know, I think you know, certainly when you watch a player, I mean, we knew with John Stones, and we've not had the likes since John Stones since Till till Brantwaite, and he loves defending as well. That's the main thing. And I think we, John Stones didn't lose his way at Everton as such. He just, he, he, you could see what was going to happen to him. And he started, he started obviously wanting to do more football inside of things rather than defend, defending. Whereas Jared Brantwaite just at this moment certainly just wants to defend, loves to defend, celebrates time. Times, you know, when he when he has those moments where he's done something really well, and I think, you know, I think if Everton can just hold on to him for one more season, I think it would benefit him as much as it would benefit Everton just to get any of those little issues out of his system. We saw it the Etty had the way Harlan just you know put him on his backside. It was one of those things that looked worse than it actually was. He because he actually had a really good game that day. He was so composed and possession but obviously afterwards the the match of the day highlights will show Haaland you know brushing him off quite easily but he was superb that day and he has been generally all season I can fully understand why clubs want him but I do feel like they would be getting on him on the cheap anyway this season if they went for him this summer because they'll know this is when Everton are at their weakest I think with one more season in the Premier League proven that consistency I think you know the sky is the limit for them for the young man he strikes me as an individual who will look at mistakes and sort of Harlan's clever movement, mm. you know, and sort of imbalancing him. He'll he'll absolutely learn from that. He'll sit down with coach. I mean, he's got a fairly decent centre half as his his manager who mm. will just, I'm sure, is drilling stuff like that into him. So, uh, I mean, he's probably only about 75% of his potential at the moment. I mean, you can just see him going on because he's got that work ethic and desire to learn and improve. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He's going to be uh, going to be a star, whether it's for Everton or somebody else. And obviously, whether he gets that chance in the summer will be really interesting as well. But one of his teammates, obviously, for Everton and England, Jordan Pickford, who Everton fans, I feel like, have had to defend for, for every year he's been at Everton. I really do. And obviously, he's played for England all the way through um, Southgate's time at England. Do you think this season is the first time that he's really being recognised for his club form as well as his international form because I did see that he he was um, he was in goal for a lot of people's Premier League uh, team of the year and I think that's the first time that's happened. Do you think he's starting to transcend just that England form now and and show that he he can do for for Everton as well? Well, I think for Everton and also nationally, I think he's being appreciated. I know. The one or two Everton fans who are slightly sceptical of him, but I think he was your Player of the Year this year. Mm. Was it? Was he Player of the Year last year as well? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
yeah, I just think he's. I mean, I've always admired him. I like him as a as a character. He's a strong, uncomplicated, mm. sort of defiant individual. In a way, he's a bit like Sean Dice. He's exactly what you need yeah. at the moment. Uh, David Rea at Arsenal won the the Golden Glove, but you look at the defence he had in in front of him. You know, Saliba and Gabriel are outstanding centre halves. Obviously, Arsenal had a lot of possession. Were further down the mm. pitch. Pickford. Okay, he had Tarkovsky and, and Branthwaite. We've spoken about their qualities, but he, you know, he had to make a lot of saves. And I just love his character. You know, he's he's a he's a winner. When you're under pressure, he's a fighter. It's exactly what you want. So, uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a huge fan of his. And also, little things like well, not little things because they're important, but community sides. I mean, you've got you and Arsenal have got the the best two community initiatives, foundation schemes in the country, the oldest and the best. Mm. And I've done a couple of events with with Jordan Pickford, and you you get to know which players have really got their heart in it, or, or those who are just knowing it's a contractual thing they have to tick off for that month. Pickford was absolutely totally committed to it. it was uh, um, actually the kids were learning maths. My maths is terrible, but Pickford was <laughs> right in there teaching them maths. Um, and yeah, so you know he's he's generally. Look, point i'm trying to make is he's a good ambassador yeah. for you as well as being a very good goalkeeper are you surprised that tarkowski didn't get a look in for england this year just 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 purely you mentioned there the defense just purely on the numbers i i find it really strange like with a with a back four as well as Everton have done this season and um and those three players being the the absolute bedrock of it you know it, obviously Branthwaite and, and and pickford get all the headlines but tarkowski's been superb this season has been superb for both seasons and it, i just find it strange that he hasn't had a, a, a look in for england certainly with going into a tournament with the problems that england have had and harry Maguire being injured and just problems all over that back four really do you, th- do you think he should have got a little look in I mean, I went to see him at the start of the season when things were really, you know, there were a lot of problems mm. and defeats and, you know, he was brilliant. He was just sort of sitting in the canteen or that sort of room next to the canteen, just sort of exuding calm control, you know, which is his nature and which is so important for, for a centre-back, particularly in times of trouble. Mm. So I just think he's a he's a leader. I think it might have been an age thing. I think yeah. Southgate, certainly in the 33, which he's got at the moment, wanted mm. to have a look at a sort of Kwanzaa. But yeah. then Lewis Dunk was in there. Um, I mean, you, you can make a case for Eric Dyer who got to the Champions League yeah. semi-finals as well. But I do think, I, I mean, you know, it's a fair point. Mark Gaze came, came back from injury, so that's important. Cons is in there as well. Um, I mean, England have got some options in there, but it's, it's you know, John Stones, when he is fully fit and sharp and he's been on the bench a bit too regularly, for, probably for Southgate's liking for City mm. recently. He, I mean, he is elite class. Yeah. Maguire's obviously slightly on the way down. Gay at some point, Branthwaite at some point will be absolute elite class. Um, mm. But yeah, maybe there was an opportunity for him there in the uh, in the 33 because he would, even if he knew he wasn't going to the Euros, he would give him everything because he's that sort of team man. Yeah, it, it, yeah, certainly. And, and obviously the last squad of uh, the last tournament obviously had Connor Cody in it. And just, just to have that sort of emergency player who, who you know can run through a brick wall for you, I think James Tarkowski would certainly do that. And just that connection he's got with Brandweight and Jordan Pickford. I know he's I know he's not he's not too fond of Jordan Pickford screaming at him, but certainly I just just the the, the season he had he's been absolutely superb. Yeah, and you, you you've needed individuals like that. You've needed characters like that. Also from a media perspective, you need someone who can come out and just talk and talk positively, talk calmly, and that message then you know, it sends a message, obviously, to teammates, to to supporters. I, I just think he's, yeah, he's a good, Tarkovsky's a great ambassador. Mm. Nice guy as well. Really, really enjoyed his company. Yeah, he seem, seems like a really, doesn't 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 seem to have forgotten his roots and playing for Oldham and, and all that kind of thing. But what he is, is obviously an embodiment, it seems like, of uh, the man in the dugout, Sean Dice, who, uh, who, who, uh, for Everton fans, it has been a bit of an up and down season with Sean Dyche, I must admit. I know personally I've had my moments where you just can't seem to figure this guy out. And then um I know certainly at the end of the season, certainly when he put the tracksuit on, it sort of it sort of changed his image and changed how people um looked at him. But when you take a step back, and I'm sure it's different for you being in the media and being able to see without the emotion. But uh, when you well, now the season is over and you look at how many points Everton would have achieved without the points deduction, he he did a magnificent job, didn't he? Oh, fantastic job! And 
he's the perfect man for this situation um because he's a he's a, he's a firefighter he's well he's 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 calm he'll go in and he he'll, he'll just say come on lads he's, he's absolutely what you need there's no ego to uh, to him it's not about him it's about the team it's about getting the club out of this difficult situation he's a he's a center half you know he was a tough center half and broke his leg early under mm. under Clough and you know he's a he's a fighter he's fought back from him but also you have to remember it and everyone rightly talks about how important he's been to Everton Football Club but also how important Everton Football Club a club of stature, a club of history, a club of a huge fan base, have been for him, because he's you know, obviously he did he did well at Burnley, mm. but then coming to a club like Everton, and I was there yesterday, and I just walked round the ground. That amazing sort of timeline you've got, that mural of the timeline you've got, you know, reminding, just remind. I mean, I knew a lot of it, but reminding me of the great players you've had, the great moments you've had mm. in history, the fact that you were founder members of the football league, founder members of the the Premier League. You know, with respect to Burnley, you've achieved a bit more than they have. And, you know, so he steps in and he's just done, done I think he's done fantastically with uh, with you. But I think that position was made for him. And, you know, probably an Everton in their pomp probably wouldn't have considered a Sean Dyche. No, but Everton's very much in that in the pump. And, and, you know, what's funny about the timeline is it does generally dry up around the time of the Premier League. Everton have been stuck... Um, have been stuck a little bit in time since the Premier League has uh, started, really, and we've seen that with results on the pitch and obviously only one trophy in that time. And uh, But what Sean Dyche does seem to be is a bit of a throwback to two managers that Everton have had in the past and someone who, who you can connect with them. Do you, do you find him... Do you find them slightly different though? Sometimes, you know, when you're speaking to him personally or off the record or sitting in a room without any cameras in, then the person maybe we see with the cameras because I think... Sometimes I do think it is. It's, it can be a little bit difficult to connect with them. He has all these little jokes that he that he that not everyone understands and things like that. You know, do you think he there is a character there that maybe we quite haven't seen as the Everton manager so far? We used to have this sort of semi-formal, well, just a bit of fun at the start of the season. Uh, the individuals in the press box of who would you, which Premier League manager would you most? want to go for a drink with mm. and which Premier League manager would you most want alongside you in a fight? Now, as you can imagine, <laughs> I'm not a big fighter, but I, I'd stretch my imagination. And Sean Dyche regularly came out on top in both because he's, you know, he, he would look after himself. He would defend the people around him. And also he's, he's great company. I mean, yeah. You can talk about most things with him. You can talk about politics. You can talk about travel. You can talk about the Hacienda. Most of his conversations <laughs> seem to lead back to him going to the Hacienda and the sort of, you know, the great bands yeah. that he, he used to go and go and watch. And obviously football as well. And it slightly annoys me when he gets a bit pigeonholed as a sort of old school British manager with not much depth. I mean, mm. if you went down to Burnley's training ground and saw how it transformed almost from porter cabins to a sort of, you know, gleaming, almost sort of NASA style complex when they developed it over the, the that small river there. I mean, it was fantastic. You know, you just looked at the sports science element, the nutrition element. And, you know, this is this is not a sort of a naive ingenue football manager there's a lot of depth mm. to him as well and maybe it was the voice maybe it was just him maybe it was him, you know the way he played or whatever but yeah he's a he's a good good manager yeah how how much do you think he's benefited from and this is this will seem strange but he has been the only voice at Everton the entire season and with everything going on you mentioned Farad Mashiri before Farad Mashiri has gone AWOL this year let's be honest he's, he thought 777 were going to take over the club he's completely gone AWOL and the only communication that's really come out of the football club he has been Sean Dyche and every question he's had to um, he's had to, had to bat away or he has spoke up about the ownership side of things and everything is on his shoulders really it seems at the moment do you think do you think he he loves that? Do you think he would love he loves that even more because of the size of Everton Football Club? I think yeah, it's an interesting point. I think man, I think in difficult times you need one voice. Mm. You need that symbol of unity. You need that expression of unity, and he's very good on that. And he gets asked a lot of things, not so simply football things. And because of the nature of the man, that innate defiance you've actually needed that to underpin every pronouncement that's made by the club. And, you know, he's, he's done that. So, yeah, I think, I mean, it was, 
it was a it was a horrible storm which hasn't mm. abated yet. I no. mean, I understand a bit more optimism going to the new season, a bit more optimism going to the new ground in it whenever it is a year's time. Mm. But you've still got a lot of got a lot of mess to get through first. You know, obviously on the ownership, sorting out the debts. But I do think they're good people there who are working, and you just need the right person to come in and 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 lead. I mean, you look at say, you know, Leeds United had that disappointment at, at the weekend, further along. Um, a club further along the M62, and but they've got good owners who've been working behind the scenes for about two years, sorting it out, sorting the, the issues out with the place. You know, it, it takes time, but there are good owners out there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, we are working through it, and I think you know, uh, getting a new owner in is is absolutely huge. But the people at the club at the moment are are obviously trying to do their very best to to make the the most of a uh, out of a bad situation. And uh, you know, uh, j- just before I let you go, obviously. You know, we know the job he's done, and obviously it was it was made even harder for him by points deductions last season. Um, what what do you think about that in the you know for obviously next season as well? Do you think this is something Everton and other clubs will have to face again, or do you think that it will be you know the Premier League will and certainly the clubs will be meeting? Do you think they'll look to calm that down and try and get away from? the hype and, and hysteria around that last season because it did really grab hold of the season. I thought, I mean, obviously I'm only speaking from an Everton point of view, but speaking to people from Forest and, and other people broadcasters talking about the possibility of not knowing at the end of the season who who was going to be relegated because no one knew if the point deduction was going to be sorted out. Do you think that'll be calmed down next season or are we going to face another season of that? I mean, the game should be, the season should be decided on the pitch. It should mm. be decided in in the court, uh, you know, a month or so later, or in this case with Manchester City and they deny all charges, the 115 charges, but there has to be a consistency. There has to be a transparency. There has to be also a speed to justice. Now we can argue that with Manchester City, the Premier League might've been more sensible just to have taken 10 charges and focused on, on those. But I think it undermined the Premier League's case. And the Premier League did have a legitimate case against Everton mm. and Forest. You can argue to how much of, of an extent, but in terms of the uh, the overspending. Um, but I just think there has to, you know, if you're going to punish Everton and Forest within a season, you should also uh, address others. You know, I think Chelsea got one or two outstanding issues. Um, Manchester City clearly do uh, as well. Again, they, they deny everything. I just thought that stinks because there's still an asterisk to the season yeah yeah it's uh it, obviously next season there could be more and more but we'll have to wait and see but uh it is that thing that just seems to be i mean it felt worse last season going into last season just that thing of hanging over our heads and we weren't quite sure how it was going to play out but i think now that we know it, it, it how it all works and 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 it seems to be getting you know, the more the more they learn about it, and the more they're going through the experiences. Obviously, the the le- maybe the less of the charges, and obviously less the city going to have to face something soon. Um, but yeah, as you said, I mean, we've said from the start. I mean, the idea of a point deduction just seems very strange when there's so many other things. You know, you could uh, you could cut people's um, squads down. You could you could have a transfer ban. There are so many things that you could do to stop a team from having an advantage. And the points the points once only for us we had to wait three months to to go from ten points to six points. Whereas Forest found out pretty quickly um, about theirs and their appeal, and it just it just felt like they were they were they were learning as they were or they were making it up as they were going on. To be honest. Which you can't run an organisation like that. Mm. I mean, that is just, it's just so patently, uh, patently unfair. But the, the issue that, well, one of the issues that Everton have at the moment is you look at the teams who are, who are coming up, you know, they are stronger than the three who went down. You look mm. at Leicester, they've got good players. Whoever comes in, assuming that Moresca goes, whether it's Carlos Corbin, you know, they will be strong even with maybe a couple of points deduction, whatever, whatever they get. Ipswich, there's a momentum two um and southampton have got some good premier league players so i think it's going to be a tough you know finishing what do you have to do um uh, 17th you know it is it's not going to be as easy as before i think it's going to be it's going to be more of a dogfight next season so everton need to hold on to as many players as possible and um and start well yeah absolutely and just before i let you go henry um it is the last season of goodison park coming up i mean how how much are you going to miss it? I mean, you must have some fond memories of it yourself being there as a reporter. 
I mean, just walking around it, just the outside of it, it's just special, but you've got to move on. Yeah. I mean, it just, and you look at the new stadium and you think of the, the finances from that. But the key thing is, is that you take the atmosphere and I like the South stand because I like, I like the rake. It's got a good steep rake. Yeah. So you go to grounds like Wembley and Emirates to an extent, and they, do, they have a more shallow rake and it loses some of the atmosphere. I like, grounds the likes of ravines and you're going into an ambush and you can <laughs> feel the you know the fans thirteen thousand fans in that south stand right on top of the pitch and the the opposing wing can feel the sort of you know the breath of the of the everton fans on on on, on their neck and they can hear everything that's said and it is intimidating and you will bring that energy into a new place it might take a you know a big game a big performance even a big tackle to sort of embed you into that but it will be special because of the location. I mean, it's it's a stunning location. I mean, just having a look at it yesterday. I mean, it is it is magnificent. Um, so look, I wish you well in it, but just make sure you're in the Premier League. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, Henry. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you as ever. Henrywinter.com is where you can find daily articles from Henry. Obviously, he'll be covering the Euros, Champions League on Saturday. Oh, I'll be watching. You're not, are you there? Gonna... You got, you... No, I've been oh. watching Bellingham from afar, but I've got my radio program in the morning, so we'll be dissecting it uh, nice. on the, on TalkSport. So, uh, yeah. It's, uh, but it'll be a game. I just wish there was an English team in there. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Henry, as I said, fantastic to have you on and uh, look forward to hearing more from you during uh, next season and hopefully uh, better things for Everton to come. My pleasure. Give me a call when Jared Branthwaite goes up to uh, collect the European Championship trophy. (laughs) Thanks, Henry.